Hello and welcome to Healthcare IT Today, where we explore the latest insights and interesting stories from the world of health IT. I am sitting down again with David Sides, CEO of NextGen. I'm excited because I haven't seen him since the NextGen user conference right here in Orlando. David, welcome back to the program. Thanks, Colin. It's good to be back here. I'm excited. You're an open book, and I like that about you. We're going to have a great conversation. And now, since the last time we got together here in Orlando for the NextGen user conference, I went and visited Venice Family Clinic and did a ride along with them and really got to see how much they rely on the NextGen mobile app. Just amazing what they're able to do with that, providing care to the folks in the community. So I have to ask on their behalf and on behalf of a lot of people who use that app, what investments are you making in that mobile app? Um, so we're making a lot of, of new investments. Uh, for instance, we added in um, for the user conference a year before mm -hmm. the ability to do controlled substances. So mm -hmm. if you were, you know, in that same example, if somebody had just had a um, knee replacement and lost their medication or whatever, you could give them those, those other medications. At this conference, we announced the Ambient Assist, our um, ability to use uh, lots of different algorithms. So we're not tied to one specific you know, provider. We use lots of providers to get the results we're looking for, but to um, listen to the conversation, nothing's saved. So we don't save anything. So there's no cyber risk of that or your conversation coming out. When you click sign, that's the only thing that we sign is the, the physician provider note. Um, and that that uh, came out at our before our user group meeting, but that's been um, really taking off. Mm -hmm. And now we're adding into it um, uh, the ability to do orders oh, from wow. that conversation and even billing codes. So by the, the, the goal is, we don't want the physicians to have to adapt their practice to the EMR, um, like some of our um, other providers do, where they have a set way you do things and you have to do it that way. We think doctors should be able to practice medicine and providers practice however they want, and we'll adapt to them. So the EMR will adapt to them. So you want to talk about the, you know, the ac action or plan or whatever, you, you don't have to go in any kind of particular order. We'll get it right for you and get it to where the end of that conversation, you click a button to sign it and you're done. And you're so done. That's the entire workflow is one click, maybe a couple edits. So no more dictating, no more need for perhaps a live scribe, no more transcribing your own notes later on. It's just the ambient assist is right there. It'll take the note and then you hit the sign button and it's right into. Right. I mean, so it's, it has been an evolution because a couple of years ago we were doing virtual scribes. Right. Right. So it was like an on person, in person scribe, you know, let's call it $5,000 a month. A virtual scribe, $1,500 a month. So you're getting some real efficiencies just by that move. But now, you know, our ambient assist is about $500 a month. So you're going from 6,000 to 500. A month. Yeah. And you can get things done in a new way that we think is compelling for people because it's less documentation and you're saving, you know, a nice new car every year exactly. as a provider, right? That's a recurring that fee. Is. That so, is, and, and I can tell you, just watching uh, Venice Family Clinic, Clinic and the team there, that will be a big, make a big difference for them, whether they're just talking with the patients that they're seeing, having the ambulances there, and not having to do a separate transcription that would then be translated back into the EHR. Right, and I love the way they practice too, right? Mm -hmm. So if you think about, the, I think they serve a large you know, um, population of people experiencing homelessness, mm -hmm. right? And so if you think about, when you, when you talk about that patient journey, I think it exposes how ridiculous the current patient journey is even for us, mm -hmm. right? So it's, I call, I make an appointment because I was you know, prompted to do something for my health. Then I have to go to their location to see them. And then you know they prescribe something for me, let's say, and then I have to go to a pharmacy <laughs> to get my drugs and then I have to go home. I mean, right. it's ridiculous. And so, but if you put that same context and you say that same thing with a person who's experiencing homelessness, right? Okay, how are they gonna walk to the clinic? How are they gonna call and get an appointment? Right. How, where's the follow-up? Where do I get my drugs? I walk in CVS and get my drugs and they're asking for my drug card? I don't have a drug card, right? So I, I, I love what, you know, we've served a third of the FQHCs in the US and the underprivileged. We just really are deeply passionate about that market's real strong part of our vision because someone like Venice goes out, they treat people where they are. You're in an underpass, that's fine. You're in a tent, that's fine, right? Um, don't have to make an appointment. Right. I'm coming to you. I you know, do the assessment of whatever you, you need, do blood work. 
give them the medications right there. It's not like go figure out how to get medications, which you're not going to be able to figure out. And you're, you're not having to navigate this crazy health ecosystem. They're bringing it to two patients. I mean, I, I just love the work they do. It's inspiring. They are truly meeting the patients where they are. You know? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Now, David, I got to switch gears a little bit with you. There's a question that we get a lot, uh, and that's from a lot of the people who are fans of Mirth, right. the platform that, that is now it's part of, uh, of NextGen. What are you doing with the Mirth platform? What can you tell our audience about that? Because they're anxious to know more. Yeah. So, I mean, we've owned Mirth for a long time. Um, we're expanding it. So one thing that is, has happened that we've invested in the last year is we were selling Mirth all, or selling or, or people are downloading Mirth all over the world. Even in, you know, geographies like the EU where, you know, we don't, we hadn't been GDPR compliant. Right. And people are still using it. It's that good of a tool. And so in the past year and a half, we've worked to become GDPR compliant. So then we can go to people and say, look, if you want the GDPR compliant version, there's an upcharge, but you, you can use the GDPR compliant version as well. Mm. Um, okay. So, you know, we'll do some international expansion and just constantly adding new channels. Like we believe interoperability is at the core. That's why we have Mirth. We run a, um, uh, a, about a third of the um, health data hub, health mm -hmm. data exchanges in the US and, right. and the HIEs. And so we're like, okay, this is core to the getting consumers better care and driving down the cost of healthcare if you don't know that that lab was ordered yesterday, you're going to order it again. So that interoperability is really key. Mirth will continue to enable that. And we'll continue to invest and bring that solution forward. It is kind of a hidden gem because there's so many people yeah. that are using it, so many people that still rely on it, yet yeah. it's not really talked about uh, a lot publicly. It's just sort of this, I won't say part of the plumbing, but in a good way, it's part of the plumbing. Like it's yeah. it's just there, it works. People love it, people love using it. And it's, it's encouraging to hear that you're actually investing more in it. Yeah, we've invested a lot too in, in training. So there's a lot of demand for training. So we've hired more trainers to help train more people on, on how to use that tool because it's so you know ubiquitous um, that you really you know you need people using it, and knowing how to do things because it's a lot less expensive than some of the competitive offerings, and it works fantastic. Now, you, David, you mentioned something right off the top that I want to zero in on. You talked a little bit about cybersecurity risk. And given the events of the last little while, we all know what's happening right now in the news. Yeah. It's put a real spotlight on cybersecurity. NextGen has been moving slowly uh, into the cloud. Obviously, the word cybersecurity now starts to rear its head. What are you doing? Or how is this changing your approach? Or what investments have you made in the cybersecurity area? We've made a lot of investments. So we use CrowdStrike across everything. And we'd always done that on the client-facing side. But it, as this shows, right, it could be it comes in through HR accounting. Um, and, um, you know, I would imagine that this was an external threat. Mm -hmm. So one thing we've, we've, we've always implemented zero trust, okay. you know, with all of our suppliers, but now we, we view every client that way. Mm. So thinking about your end users in a zero trust right. environment is different. So we've introduced multi-factor authentication across everything because that way, if somebody fishes, it's going to happen. We right, have a sure. hundred thousand providers. Somebody's going to get fished. If it's just username and password you're relying on, they can get in, right. and that's not a, that's not a good thing. So, um, adding MFA in puts another barrier. And then we're looking at if they're you know filters for if they're logging in somewhere we don't expect you know logging you know. So there's a lot of other things there, but um, you know that you, you see how um, uh, you know this is part of the key infrastructure of US healthcare, right? I mean, there's yeah. there's probably billions of dollars held up right now. And the other thing I think it shows is that um, everyone needs to not rely on a single exclusive provider, right? Yeah, we need some redundancy, we need some There needs some redundancy. And, and the problem is change has contracts with blues payers that they're the only ones to send data. And I think we all see that that is a horrible idea now. And I bet that comes unraveled. Well, and I think that's sort of the wake up call, right? It's, it's, right. It, Yes, the, we all knew cybersecurity risk was there. I don't think anyone's surprised. Maybe the degree and the speed of what happened. But what it's exposed is, wow, we have a, maybe an over-reliance, or, or as we put it, the, we, don't, we have a lack of redundancy built into the ecosystem here. Maybe it's time to look at that and include that as part of a risk assessment. To well, say. And it's, it grew up in that change was originally owned by the payers, right? So, um, of course, they owned it. So they, they said, oh, we'll use this. Right, so it wasn't like it was a dastardly plan, no. right? It's just it evolution just, didn't exactly. happen as much as the market should have pushed on 
hey, I want duality or, or even more redundancy for everything because we all rely on it. So David, talk to me about what's next for next gen. Like what can users expect? What are you working on now moving forward? Yeah, so you know, we talked about ambient assist. We're working on orders now, it comes out in the next couple, uh, couple months. Uh, and the billing codes, I think the orders piece is gonna be a big change. Mm. Um, and we're doing things like, you know, where the AI is not sure, or maybe it wasn't said, putting in like their, their usual dosage, mm. right? So let's okay. say somebody comes in, they have um, high cholesterol, you prescribe atorvastatin, which is also called Lipitor, and you don't say 20 milligrams in which pharmacy. Right. So we'll say, okay, the patient, you know, 20 milligrams, it's 10, 20, or 40. This is what you usually do, and this was the last pharmacy, and highlight it in yellow. So it's like, okay, the physician knows these are the parts that were unclear, and then you can sign that note and you're done. Uh, so it's much faster, or, oh yeah, I meant, I meant 10, because they're just starting on it. So a lower dose we'll start with. Excellent. Um, because that the, the adaptation, we have hundreds of people using it now. It's interesting is um, if to get it to get a, a perfect note, you have to say what you're thinking. So, you know, it's not enough, because say I'm gonna put you on a torvastatin, you need to actually explain, and people didn't do this before, but tell the patient the dose. I'm right. gonna give you 20 milligrams, um, and then the computer will get it for you. Right, it's no longer something you just remember to type in later. You right. don't have to actually articulate that. Yeah, and as a person, it's good to know, because then sure. if I go to the pharmacy and they give me 10, and the physician said 20, then I know, oh, okay, this isn't the right dose, I'll just check. Um, yeah. Otherwise, right today, you just go and what the pharmacy gives you is what you got because it's all electronic. Yeah, so we, so this change in process and change in workflow is actually a good thing, right? The fact that we're kind of making sure that the clinician so, articulates more. Because you're, you're explaining it to the patient yeah. better too, right? They know, you know, like we have a, a lot of orthopedic and ophthalmic um, eye, eye doctors at clients as well. And so, you know, there, it could be, you mean this orally or you mean it by drops? Right. Like you need to specify. And that specification would have been good for the patient the whole time too, exactly. right? Like, yeah, I don't, I'm not giving this for you to, you know, take take with a glass of water. You need to put these drops in your eyes. Absolutely. Well, David, you shared a lot of great information with us today on the program. Where can people go to learn more about NextGen? NextGen.com. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I hope to see you at your uh, conference this year as well. Or yeah. hopefully in another we'll conference. We'll be in Nashville. Maybe. It'll be great. Oh, Nashville. Always have a good time in Nashville. Well, yeah. David, thank you for being on the program today. Great really to see you again, Colin. I appreciate it. Hey, if you enjoyed this interview as much as I did, please like and subscribe. And also head on over to healthcareittoday.com where you can find more great content like this. I'm Colin Hung, thanks for being here and I'll catch you on the next episode.